Hello and welcome to the third of the Pass Test Cardiology video series. We're now going to look at cardiac function, and particularly pay attention to valve year, myocardial and structural considerations. I'm going to start off by the, looking at the first question. That's question one. Six year old woman is found to have a systolic murmur at routine medical. When you see her, she appears asymptomatic. The ECG shows marked left ventricular hypertrophy with strain and the echocardiogram shows a peak aortic valve gradient of, of 90 with preserved left ventricular systolic function. What's the correct management? If you answered C, regular outpatient review, you are correct. This is a fairly typical scenario of, of patients we see in uh, our routine cardiology clinic. So we see people who come in referred up by the GP with uh, murmurs for assessment and uh, we will then continue to follow up these people um, over a period of you know, many years often until they may well need a surgical intervention. So in this instance, one of the most important things we know about this lady is that she's asymptomatic. So things which would really worry me about someone who has uh, aortic stenosis uh, would be that she has syncope, she has uh, symptoms of chest pain, or she has new onset breathlessness. If she has any of those, that puts her in a very high risk group, which I'm thinking very, very carefully about, going to intervene very rapidly. But what about other features of this question? Are these normal or are these abnormal? So she has an ECG showing marked left ventricular hypertrophy restraint. This is, of course, a normal feature. Just like uh, if she had a lot of hypertension, um, the, the afterload is increased as a result of the aortic stenosis, and as a result, her left ventricle gets thicker as a result, and develops left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a normal physiological response to any muscle put under strain. When people have left ventricular hypertrophy, it's frequent to see a strain pattern in their ECGs, and this looks like uh, ST depression or inverted T waves. And this is not a result of coronary artery disease, but merely a result of the increased loading of the heart and an alteration of the myocardial architecture, so they get fibrosis, and in effect they develop local myocardial ischemia. If you were to do an angiogram in most of these patients, however, they'd have unobstructed coronary arteries. That's an important distinction. So that's a normal feature. Her echo shows that she has a gradient of 90 millimeters of mercury, which clearly indicates that she has moderate to severe aortic stenosis, uh, but most importantly, that she has preserved left ventricular systolic function. So really here, uh, in this lady, we've got someone who's asymptomatic. She has all the features of someone who has a severe, moderate to severe aortic stenosis, but importantly, she has preserved left ventricular systolic function. So there's nothing there which is telling me that we need to push ahead and operate on this lady very, very soon. Routinely, what we would do in this case is to follow this lady up in clinic, four month, six month interval, where we would repeat her echocardiogram, looking to see primarily if the left ventricle had increased in size or if the function had decreased. If any of those two had happened, that would be very, very worrying signs and would push us towards an urgent operation. The other thing I'd be very, very cautious and I'd certainly warn her about is if she had a change in symptoms. So if she was no longer asymptomatic but then developed symptoms of syncope, chest pain or dyspnea, that would worry me and again would push me towards doing an early operation. Otherwise, we're not going to push someone into surgery just because they have a gradient of 90 or just because they have left ventricular hypertrophy or strain. That's not an indication. The indications are fairly rigorous and are largely based around symptoms and the echocardiographic criteria. We'll have a further look at those shortly. So what signs are there of uh, aortic stenosis? So clearly if there's an ejection systolic murmur, that's the loudest over the aortic area, usually best held with a patient sitting forward with breath in a held expiration. One important distinction, and certainly something which you should train yourself clinically, is to listen for the second heart sound. And if the second heart sound uh, is absent, it's usually indicative of severe aortic stenosis. And that's clearly a very useful clinical skill. If you can pick that up in the A&E department or in your medical takes, uh, then that's clearly some patient who you want to triage from a much higher category than someone who you can hear a second aortic heart sound and is more likely to have moderate aortic stenosis at worst. Often the murmurs are referred up to the carotid, so you may well have carotid brewies. As we said, there's marked strain on the heart, so the ventricle is going to be heaving, and as a result of the physical obstruction, may well have a slow rising pulse. If things get bad and the heart's no longer coping, 
course, the patient may well then go on to not sufficient, uh, shift sufficient amounts of blood through the ventricle, they start getting pooling in the venous systems, and they develop signs of heart failure. So routine investigations here would, of course, be primarily an echocardiogram to look at the gradient, to look at the flow across the aortic valve, to look at the uh, degree of contractility and the size, the dimensions of the left ventricle. So that's a very, very important test. Other tests we do routinely would be an electrocardiogram, because of course, if you've got severe aortic stenosis, if you then develop an arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation, it can make you much more symptomatic. And of course, the chest X-ray to uh, look for signs of uh, decompensation, such as pulmonary edema uh, or pleural effusions. So we spoke briefly about uh, this lady with left ventricular hypertrophy and the T-wave abnormalities. Uh, which, which associated with it, the so-called strain pattern. Here you can see uh, an, an electrocardiogram with clearly very big uh, R-wave and S-wave complexes, and you can see inverted T-waves. And as, as I've said, this is likely due to myocardial ischemia as opposed to macroscopic coronary artery disease, and the angiograms like to show unobstructed arteries. So what's the etiology of aortic stenosis? Here you can see a bicuspid aortic valve, which has become heavily calcified, and it's clear to see that there's a very small uh, area left for the valve to open, which is kind of the bottom left, around about 7 o'clock on your screen, of the, the valve leaflets. There's a small, small orifice for the, the blood still to flow through. That's clearly a congenital cause there, so they had two rather than three valve leaflets. More commonly, it could be due to rheumatic fever. Of course, a long time after the initial insult, they develop a valvular abnormality as a result of rheumatic fever or probably even the most common will be senile or degenerative disease, so just calcification of a tricuspid valve which just doesn't, doesn't open properly. So we've spoken about the importance of symptoms in determining when to operate. So the th symptoms I'm concerned about would be syncope. Uh, is there a change in uh, the pattern of angina? So have they all of a sudden they said, Doctor, I, I was able to walk up the stairs fine until last week. Now when I walk up the stairs, I'm getting short of breath or I'm getting chest pain. Those things worry me reduction in systolic function or the uh, increase in the left ventricular dimensions, again, two features which also worry me. And you can see there's good evidence for that, and here we see in these two uh, graphs on the right-hand side of your screen, we can see uh, a five-year interval on the left graph and a four-year interval on the right graph. On the, the left-hand graph, we look at the percentage survival. We've divided them into two groups. The red group have an ejection fraction of more than 45%, so relatively normal cardiac function, maybe just mildly impaired. And the, the, ones, the black line with the white squares have an ejection fraction which is reduced, so less than 45%. And you can see the percent surviving is dramatically different between the two groups. After five years, there's approximately 85% surviving in the high ejection fraction group, whereas there's around 50% surviving in the low ejection fraction group. We see at least, perhaps even more dramatic fall off if we, instead of using injection fraction, look at the end systolic dimension. So this is the size of the ventricle. We look at a normal group where the end systolic dimension is less than 55 millimeters, so this is the red line, and compare it to an abnormal group which has a big heart where the end systolic dimensions are more than 55 millimeters of mercury. And once again, we can see it's a far worse prognosis uh, in someone with a, a dilated ventricle. So clearly, we want to try and catch them before the ventricular function deteriorates, before the ventricle gets big. So we need to keep a close eye on the ventricle by doing surveillance echocardiography at four to six month intervals, and also of course pay very, very close attention to any symptoms which may change in that interval. So therapeutic options, are, you know, first will be uh, conservative medical approaches. So in some patients, they may be too elderly to undergo uh, a valvular operation. It may be that they have aortic stenosis, but really it's not that bad, and the main problem is that they have underlying uh, arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation. So often by controlling the atrial fibrillation, we slow the ventricular rate, allow more time for filling, improve myocardial perfusion, and they are much less symptomatic. It may mean that maybe that it's just a question of using some diuretics in a very elderly patient. So medical considerations are often you know, part of the fine-tuning in patients who do need surgery, but often may make up the mainstay of treatment in, in a very elderly patient who's not suitable for surgery. And then, of course, we have the mainstay still of treatment of this group will be surgical procedures. So this will be a valve replacement uh, with either tissue uh, or mechanical valve. And there are various configurations which we can use um, in, in depending on the size of the patient, 
and the, the age of the patient. And the third group here is, um, is what we perform in the catheter lab. So these are relatively new procedures. At the moment, we're only doing them on patients who get turned down for surgery. And this is where we're actually able to implant an aortic valve within the existing aortic valve by squashing it out of the way. So we put a, a wire through the aortic valve, expand everything open with a balloon, and then put an aortic valve mounted on a balloon to take the place of the existing aortic valve. So literally squash everything against the wall, uh, the, the wall and we implant a, a functioning aortic valve. And that's all done through the leg. So that's an option, a, th a third option there for patients who are, are not fit enough for, for surgery. Now, as the years progress and we get better and better at this technique, it may mean maybe that more and more people have this procedure done non-invasively, so just by a small hole in the leg rather than having to open up their chest with a formal surgical procedure. But we're still waiting more data on that prior to, to taking on younger groups of patients. We now move on to the second question, question two. A 67-year-old man with chronic heart failure is reviewed in terms of his drug therapy. Which of the following treatments has no proven mortality benefit? If you answered B, digoxin, you'd be absolutely correct. There's now very, very good evidence for the drugs we use in controlling the symptoms of heart failure. The mainstay of treatments are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. And it's important to understand the rationale for why we use these drugs. Essentially, in heart failure, the pump is failing. This causes two uh, responses in the uh, physiology. The first is that the renal arteries are underperfused, and as a result, there's a massive activation of the renin-angiotensin system. This drives arterial constriction, increases afterload, which is bad for a failing heart. The second um, abnormal physiological system which becomes activated is the sympathetic nervous system. When this becomes activated due to a low pressure, it drives a tachycardia, and it causes the heart to try and increase in its contractility. Again, two things which are bad for a failing heart. We now know that the most important things we can do to treat heart failure is to tackle these two physiological problems. And we can do that with drugs you see on the list here, such as bisoprolol, which is a beta blocker, and enalapril, an ACE inhibitor. On top of that, we also have third-line agents such as nitrates and hydralazine, and spironolactone, which has uh, clear uh, evidence to support their use in treatment of heart failure. The ideal treatment of heart failure should be up titration of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors from a very low dose gradually over a period of many months. We know that when we've managed to maximally up titrate these, it carries the best prognosis. In addition to these classes of drugs, other drugs which are frequently used would of course be diuretics but largely they should be given to treat symptoms of fluid and volume status rather than, and don't really address the core physiological question, a problem which is addressed with the enalapril and the sopralol. So what symptoms may you expect to see in patients with heart failure? So these will include shortness of breath and exertion, orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, evidence of peripheral edema such as ankle swelling, anorexia or weight loss, and this is of course due to the fact that the patients get, develop edema within the gut and are unable to absorb uh, food and nutrition properly, cold peripheries due to a decreased cardiac output, and lethargy. Signs we may see, well, activation of the renoangiotensin system and the sympathetic nervous system will drive a tachycardia, heart is failing, so you have hypotension, and you have fluid in the wrong places, so juggling this pressure becomes elevated, and you have more blood in the atria, trying to escape into the ventricle during diastole, so your third heart sound is often elevated. As the heart it dilates up and gets bigger in heart failure, it's frequent to find we have patients with a pansystolic murmur of either mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation. Other symptoms we may also observe in patients will include basal crepitation at the lung bases and ankle edema. The investigations we will typically use to uh, identify subjects with um, heart failure are principally uh, directed by uh, the ec echocardiography. So this really confirms or refutes a diagnosis and really what we're looking for here is the contractility of the heart and we can both look at that in 2D or use other modalities such as strain or tissue Doppler which effectively tracks the velocities of the heart. We can also look at 3D volumes increasingly now 
to see how the volume increases throughout the cardiac cycle and to see if it's enlarged or uh, much bigger than it should otherwise be. The other thing which we would like to do is to track the size and the dimensions of the, the heart in 2D over a period of time to see if they change or if they're elevated. Other tests we'll also do routinely would include an electrocardiogram, uh, which may well confirm the presence of a previous myocardial infarction, which we recognise as being the commonest cause of heart failure. May well can see a left bundle branch block, which may well uh, imply that there's underlying cardiac ischemia or may well be a result of previous ischemia. And we may well see non-specific ST segment changes, which may uh, neither refute or confirm the presence of ischemia. We'll also do a chest radiograph. Uh, and this is useful to identify if fluid is in the wrong places. So particularly we're looking for upper load diversion, fluid in the horizontal fissures, curly B lines, or pleural effusions. Here you can see uh, a chest radiograph of uh, a patient with, with heart failure. You can see clear evidence of fluid, uh, upper lobe diversions, uh, a larger heart than would otherwise be expected, so the cardiothoracic ratio is increased, and um, increased pulmonary vascular markings. This is a fairly typical chest radiograph. In more severe cases, of course, you may well expect pleural effusions, but we can't see that in this particular radiograph. So as we've said, treatment is, is largely medical in its nature, uh, and that's the drugs we've described earlier, so these include ACE inhibitor A2 blockers and beta blockers as our principal drivers, so it's so really trying to get this up to maximum tolerated doses before ad addition of additional agents such as spironolactone and nitrates and hydralazine. For short periods of time, we can of course give digoxin and ionotropes just to boost the blood pressure a little bit and can often get us through a gap if someone's heart is particularly bad. Uh, and of course, if we need to, we can co-administer diuretics to try and offload fluid. Wherever possible, we'll also want to make sure there's no reversible causes. So most patients who have bad heart failure will undergo coronary angiography to make sure there's no myocardial ischemia. Because what we know is if you have triple vessel disease, often if there hasn't been an infarction, if we repair the coronary arteries by either grafting or performing angioplasty, that myocardium which had been hibernating springs back to life and the myocardial function improves markedly. So that's something we really would need to exclude uh, prior to just saying this patient has bad heart failure and there's no treatment. Of course, other conditions such as anemia need also need to be addressed and uh, reversed if there is a problem there. Once we've got patients on maximum medical therapy and we've excluded reversible causes, the, the other treatment modality we now have, of course, uh, in the mainstream would be a biventricular pacemaker. A biventricular pacemaker uh, is a pacemaker which can help resynchronize the two chambers of the heart. So fundamentally, one of the problems in uh, heart failure, particularly when they have a left bundle branch block and a QRS complex which becomes widened, is the right and left ventricles no, no longer contract in a synchronized manner. So usually the left and right ventricles contract almost simultaneously, maximizing cardiac efficiency and cardiac output. In someone with a left bundle branch block, there's a delay between the left and right ventricles contracting, and as a result, the cardiac output diminishes. So by implanting a wire in the right atrium, one in the right ventricle, one in the coronary sinus, we're able to simultaneously pace the right and left ventricles, and as a result, we can restore synchronicity by causing activation of contraction from the apex upwards. So we know this works very well, and certainly the CARE-HF study showed that the five-year mortality uh, fell by 30% in patients who had uh, biventricular pacemakers implanted. Question three. A 68-year-old woman recently diagnosed with multiple myeloma presents to a GP with progressively increasing breathlessness, exercise intolerance, and ankle swelling. On examination, there's bilateral pitting of her legs to her thighs, ascites, and a raised JVP. The apical impulse is impalpable. An ECG shows diffuse, diminished voltage. Chest radiograph is normal, and the echocardiogram shows small, thick ventricles and dilated atria and a thickened interatrial septum. The ventricular myocardium has a granular, sparkly texture on echo, and minimal fluid in the pericardial space is noted. What's the most likely diagnosis here? The answer here is restrictive cardiomyopathy. 
almost certainly in this case here, the description that the examiners give you in this question is of one of an infiltrative process such as amyloid. Here you can see on this echocardiogram image here, both in the M mode on the left and in the conventional 2D, a very bright speckly appearance which is classic and pathognomonic of amyloid infiltration. In addition to restrictive type processes such as we just mentioned about with amyloid, other conditions you should know about include campanade and constriction. These conditions frequently confuse candidates but really they are quite simple. We'll just spend a moment to consider them. So constriction is effectively a problem with the pericardium. So normally your pericardium is soft, elastic structure which is supportive to the ventricle but doesn't limit its uh, relaxation. In someone with constriction, the pericardium becomes very calcified. So it's like having a shell around the outside of the heart, which so it means the heart can't relax properly. This doesn't necessarily mean that they have any myocardial disease. Of course, that may be coexisting, but merely that the, the pericardium becomes heavily calcified and it limits relaxation. This can typically occur in patients with tuberculosis, after radiotherapy, due to pericardial malignancy, after drugs such as hydralazine, and post-pericarditis, so after viral or bacterial pericarditis, uremic pericarditis, connective tissue diseases. And also, one of the most common uh, presentations we see is post-coronary artery bypass grafting. Now this differs, of course, from tamponade, whereby the, both the myocardium and the pericardium may be entirely normal. And what happens here is the space between the myocardium and the pericardium fills with fluid. Normally there's a few, few mils of fluid there which lubricates the pericardium nicely. Here this fills with a lot of fluid and prevents normal filling. This can occur as a result of all the same causes for constriction that we just discussed, but also due to dissection, myocardial infarction, pacing complications, and over-anticoagulation, okay, which is particularly bad in acute pericarditis. This is something which you should be very, very careful about if you're inexperienced and you're inserting pacing wires. Pacing wire is a stiff, stiff um, wire, and you're often putting this into subjects who have thin right ventricles, possibly after a right ventricular infarct, and it's very, very easy to perforate the ventricle. When that happens, you may well induce tamponade, which may be only become apparent on the ward afterwards. So you have to be very astute and notice any fall in blood pressure, decrease in perfusion to the peripheries, and think very, very rapidly that you may have made a small hole in the ventricle and this patient, of course, needs a pericardial synthesis, and that will, of course, solve that problem. Now move on to question four. 32-year-old man presents to the clinic with shortness of breath, which is particularly bad when he goes jogging. He has recently increased his exercise to try and reduce his weight. On a couple of occasions, he's also noticed some chest discomfort, which has caused him to stop exercising. On examination, his blood pressure is 150 over 88, and he has a double apex impulse. On auscultation, there is a harsh mid-systolic murmur which is loudest between the apex and the left sternal border. His ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy and widespread Q waves. Otherwise, his bloods are unremarkable. Which of the following is most directly correlated with increased risk of sudden death? If you answered C to this question, the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy, you're correct. Of course, this question describes very, very good symptoms and a presentation of someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We know from the research studies which have been carried out that the predisposition of sudden death is much more likely in people with markedly elevated thickness of left ventricular hypertrophy. Of course, all the other features may well be present in Hokum but are not as uh, diagnostically useful and certainly predictive of uh, the risk of sudden death. So what about the physiology of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? This is an important one to try and get your head around. The first thing to remember is that hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is a dynamic process. So it's an outflow tract obstruction as a result of the muscles on either side of the outflow tract impeding cardiac outflow of blood. It's not bad aortic stenosis, which is stopping blood moving out of the heart, which is kind of a fixed, uh, rigid structure preventing blood flowing out of the heart. And as a result of the two differences between these two pathologies, we could use various clinical manoeuvres to help distinguish between the two. 
So one test which you can commonly do will be to ask a patient to squat. So squatting does two things. The first thing it will do is increase your venous return. So as you squat, you can press your calves, get more blood coming back to the heart. More blood going across a fixed stenosis, such as aortic stenosis, it's going to increase the intensity of the murmur. And you can hear it's going to just become louder when you, listen, when you auscultate. However, the other effect of squatting is you clamp off your popliteal arteries. And as a result, you elevate your mean aortic pressure very slightly. So this has an effect on the gradient, so the pressure difference between that in the left ventricle and the aorta. So let's have a look at what this does. On the left-hand picture of the heart there, you can see with the patient standing up, the pressure in the left ventricle is 160, and the pressure in the aorta is 100. So the difference between the two is the gradient, and that's approximately 60 millimetres of mercury. When we squat, this clamps the popliteal arteries and prevents aortic pressure falling. So here you can see, rather than the pressure falling to 100 millimetres of mercury, as it did uh, in when the patient's standing up, it only falls to 130 millimetres of mercury. So now the gradient, the difference between the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure, is reduced from 60 to 30 millimetres of mercury. And as a result, the two sides, the two walls of the outflow tract, are held more widely open, and the Hocken murmur intensity diminishes. So this is a simple test you can do by the bedside, whereby if you ask a patient to squat and you listen for murmurs, if the murmur increases in intensity, it's likely to be a stenotic valvular uh, murmur. If, however, it decreases in intensity, then it may well be an outflow tract obstruction such as hokum. And you certainly should become familiar with this, because this is a, a question which comes up frequently. The opposite occurs when we valsalva. Okay, so valsalva, of course, reduces the amount of blood coming back to the heart, during an active valsalva, and it's going to soften any systolic valvular murmur. But in reducing the amount of blood coming back to the heart, it increases the gradient across the outflow tract obstruction from hokum and will increase the intensity of the hokum murmur. So valsalva has the opposite effect. It decreases the intensity of the, of the valvular stenosis, but it increases the intensity of the hokum stenosis. Here we have a summary table which compares the two. Now, I've been speaking about the differences between one being a, a valvular stenosis and a disease valve, one being a muscle problem, but of course the heart also sees the end effect of that. So it sees that it's just hard to pump blood out, and as a result the heart muscle gets thicker, and as a result the heart has to work extra hard to try and squeeze blood out. So some of the features are similar. So you certainly will see a jerky or slow rising pulse in both of them. The heart's having to work very, very hard, so you have a heaving, heaping apex beat in both aortic stenosis and hokum. However, in hokum, you wouldn't expect normally the aortic valve to be affected. So one may expect the, aortic, the second heart sound to be normal, whereas in aortic stenosis, they will be soft or in severe aortic stenosis, absent. Aortic regurgitation would be rare in someone with hokum, but of course it's common if someone has a stenosed aortic valve. It's often that the valve either doesn't open properly and doesn't close properly, so they have a degree of aortic regurgitation. And then we have these physiological parameters which vary uh, with valsalva and squat, which we've just been uh, discussing in detail in the preceding slide. We know that hokum is inherited as an autosomal dominant condition in approximately 50% of cases, and of those we know the genes for about 75%. Uh, other conditions, of course, can cause an abnormally thickened heart muscle. These include Friedrich's ataxia, pheochromocytoma by generating lots of left ventricular hypertrophy, Noonan's, and Fabre's disease, so that's an alpha-1 galactosidase deficiency. Hokum itself is associated with mitral valve prolapse and other conditions such as Wolf Parkinson White. And the murmur can be louder when we stand from the squat, uh, during a valsalva, during things which make the chamber smaller, so hypovolemia, during vasodilation, with inotropes, and post-ventricular ectopy. The next slide you can see is uh, a histopathological specimen of a normal heart on the left and a hokum heart on the right. And it's very clear to see the difference between the two. The heart on the left, you can see uh, a nice thick wall of the left ventricle, but you can also see there's a nice big lumen. And the lumen, of course, allows lots of blood to fill during diastole, and it means that the cardiac output is preserved. You can also see the very delicate trabeculated structure on the far left side, that's the right ventricle, of the right ventricle, of course, this is a much lower pressure structure, normally seeing pressures of about 25 millimetres of mercury, and you can see delicate trabeculations there, which is entirely normal. 
Now, if you compare that to the Hokum heart on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see that, firstly, the left ventricle, the cavity, is almost totally obliterated because the wall has become so much thicker, and that's really very, very obvious. You can also see similar changes happen to the right ventricle, so that delicate trabeculation which was present has now become absent, so it's no longer there. So that's very, very clear histopathological changes. Of course, ideally, we want to try and identify this before the patient dies and before we get to this stage in the path, in path lab. So this is why we can image patients with echo. And here you can see similar kind of changes uh, during echocardiography. So on the left-hand image here, you see a nice big left ventricular lumen with a, with a thin left ventricular wall. And on the right-hand side, you can see the thick wall and a much, much smaller left ventricular lumen. So you can clearly see in these cases here, there's not much room for filling of that left ventricular lumen. So the heart's really having to work very, very hard to maintain a cardiac output. Now move on to question five. A neonate is noted to be cyanosed within the 24 hours following delivery. Which cardiac abnormality would be most likely cause? If you answered E, transposition of the great vessels, you'd be correct. If we were considering this question without the 24-hour time window, by far and away the most common uh, pathological condition on this list would, of course, be tetralogy of fallow. However, that typically only presents six to nine months of, uh, after birth. So at birth, we're really looking at transposition of the great vessels, whereby the aorta and pulmonary arteries are plumbed into to the wrong side of the heart. This chest radiograph demonstrates um, a typical boot-shaped heart, which is seen in uh, Fallow's tetralogy. Now, it's important to recognise the abnormality here. In a normal heart, the apex is down towards the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. However, here you can see I've drawn a horizontal line and shown how the apex has been upwardly diverted uh, and rotated. And this is typical of a, a boot-shaped heart, which is associated with Fallot's tetralogy. So there are four main features associated with this condition. These would include ventricular septal defect, and as a result, there's more pressure in the right ventricle, so the right ventricle gets thicker and develops right ventricular hypertrophy. This is made worse by the fact that there's pulmonary stenosis, so the right ventricle is working even harder. And the whole of the anatomy is wrong, so the aorta, rather than lying directly over the left ventricle, has been shifted to lie over the septum, so-called overriding of the aorta. Now, we can make symptoms worse with people with this condition by doing anything which reduces total peripheral resistance. So two examples may well be getting out of a hot bath or being in a hot bath and standing up or lying on a hot beach. In both of those scenarios, your, your muscle beds vasodilate, and as a result, your mean aortic pressure falls. In that scenario, your right ventricle has two choices. It can either squeeze really hard and try and push blood through the pulmonary arteries, or it can say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to instead push blood through your right ventricle, bypassing the lungs and to the rest of the body. Of course, when that happens, when deoxygenated blood goes to the systemic circulation, you become very symptomatic and may see features such as fingertips and lips going blue. You have deoxygenated blood in the systemic circulation. Now I'm going to turn to question six. A 69-year-old man has been admitted to the emergency department with syncope. He felt hot, complained of nausea, and then fainted. His ECG was normal. His brother suffers from adult onset epilepsy. What is the most appropriate investigation? If you answered E, tilt test should be correct. This is a classical situation of uh, a patient presenting with symptoms of presyncope, feeling nausea, dizzy, and then going on to develop symptoms of syncope. And it really illustrates the importance of um, getting a very, very good history. If you can elicit symptoms of um, dizziness preceding uh, either a, a presyncopal collapse, which leads to collapse, or a presyncope, which leads to syncope, that makes it much more likely that someone is having a, a vasovagal episode uh, rather than an arrhythmia. If, however, a patient comes in and says, Doctor, I was walking down the road, and all of a sudden I found myself on the floor, I had no uh, awareness of uh, any events ha happening before that, then you should be much more attuned to thinking this may well be a rhythmogenic problem or it may well be an epileptic problem. But clearly here there's a history which precedes that 
So in the, evident, in the absence of any significant valve for abnormality, I'd be thinking maybe a hypotensive episode, maybe it's a hot day, he's on diuretics, for instance, or maybe it's a vasovagal episode. And certainly we would go on to do a tilt test here, which is a test whereby we f uh, fix patients to a table which can be moved from the horizontal position to an almost vertical position. We monitor blood pressure and ECG and see how the normal physiology behaves when it's uh, stress tested in this way. In addition to just looking at it over at basal, at basal uh, conditions, we can also administer uh, drugs such as uh, uh, sublingual GTN and also perform carotid sinus massage to see if we can uh, exacerbate the effects which have, presented, uh, which have led to the initial presentation. And typically for a positive test, we'll be looking for periods of bradycardia and hypotension. Now, of course, sometimes patients may present and you don't have uh, features which would point towards a diagnosis of vasovagal syncope and they may well have an ECG abnormality which shows uh, complete heart block, and they may be very, very symptomatic. And in these scenarios, of course, you may want to push ahead and uh, pace them, okay? Ideally, uh, if, someone is, if it's not gonna be a transient thing, so they haven't taken an overdose of beta blockers or haven't got acute renal failure with massive derangement of electrolytes, and they're gonna need you know, a pacemaker uh, permanently, in an ideal setting, we would look to do that. So we look to implant a permanent pacemaker at that setting. It's good for the patient uh, in terms of reducing the infection risk and also of course reduces the number of uh, procedures they have to have. But in some circumstances we need to increase the heart rate because someone may be very very bradycardic, very uh, um, shocked and compromised. So there are a few different strategies we've got for dealing with that. The uh, first will be to administer drugs such as isoprenaline and second will be to uh, temporary pace them, and that can either be by a pacing wire, which you can insert via the internal jugular vein or at the femoral vein. And uh, a more immediate a way of temporary pacing may well be to use temporary pacing pads. So you position these pads on the chest, uh, much in the way as you position pads for uh, DC cardioversion, and you pace them through uh, the same DC cardioversion box. As I've described, by far and, the best, by far and away the best thing to do with patients if they are likely to need a permanent pacemaker system is to implant it there and then. But of course, that's not always a possibility. Um, and there are various options we have for pacemakers. So this may be a single chamber device, so just the single ventricular lead. Maybe a dual chamber device, so this has got two leads, so one in the atrium, one in the ventricle. It may be a biventricular pacemaker, which has got an atrial lead a lead in the right ventricle and a lead which paces the left ventricle going via the coronary sinus which is a big vein which runs around the left side of the heart. Maybe an internal cardiac defibrillator which is a pacemaker we implant if someone's presented with ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Or it may be a biventricular pacemaker which we spoke about being important in the management of heart failure which can exist with and without an, an internal cardiac defibrillator so that's a dual function pacemaker. So what are the indications for temporary pacing? Well, as cardiologists, we're frequently called upon to put in temporary pacing wires by the anaesthetist prior to um, surgery uh, for trifascicular block. So a scenario may, hit, may be that a, an old lady has come in, she's fractured her hip, uh, she needs to go and have a, a, a general anaesthetic, and the anaesthetist has noted some conduction abnormalities on her ECG. The trifascicular block would be a left bundle branch block, right axis deviation, and a first degree heart block. So they're the features I'm looking for. The problem here is the induction. The induction agents can often make conduction worse and patient may become unstable on the, on the operating table. So that's why they need to just become wary. Usually, we can pull the pacing wire out immediately after the patient comes out of the operating theater. Sometimes if people are having angioplasty, okay, that's the next one on the list here you see, uh, particularly to the right coronary artery, where uh, because the right coronary artery supplies a sinoatrial node, patient may become very bradycardic. Okay, so routinely we may give some, uh, some atropine in those situations, but if we're really worried, we can insert a, a, a pacing wire and just have it there just in case we need it and we can pace people um, to uh, ensure that they don't become too bradycardic. Sometimes if people come in with profound uh, hypothyroid, we call to intensive care to insert a, a temporary pacing wire in compromised bradycardia. Uh, in patients who present with myocardial infarction, which is becoming much less common because of uh, primary uh, PCI, so intervening very, very early, uh, clearing a, a, an occlusion and preventing heart block, but sometimes we need to put uh, these temporary wires in because usually it is only a temporary holding manoeuvre because once perfusion has been restored to the myocardium, normal sinus rhythm uh, re uh, reoccurs. 
Uh, some patients present with asystole or may have asystolic episodes and they're dangerous to have on the wards without a temporary pacing wire. And then there's some specialist indications such as overdrive pacing. So this may be someone who has incessant ventricular tachycardia. And what we try and do is we insert a, a right ventricular pacing lead and pace faster than the ventricular rhythm to try and take control of the, uh, the arrhythmia and then stop pacing all of a sudden and then hope that the heart reverts back to sinus rhythm. And then in very difficult scenarios, very specialist settings, if people have very difficult uh, atrial fibrillation, we may well give them, uh, even in the short term, uh, high dose beta blockers and put a pacing wire in. So controlling the rate whilst making sure they don't go too slow. So what about permanent pacing? So complete heart block. So anyone who comes in with third degree heart block, we're going to put a, a permanent, permanent pacemaker in because we're worried that conduction may get even worse or they may have failure of conduction through the ventricle and they may just have asystole. Sometimes people who have very troublesome, very difficult to control atrial fibrillation have the AV node ablated. So that means no longer is there any communication from the atrium to the ventricle. And in those people, they become totally reliant on the pacemaker and we have to implant a pacemaker. Now we come back to triversicular block, the case we spoke about uh, in the preceding slide. And uh, in this scenario, if, if we think this patient had triversicular block and this led to a, a degree of complete heart block or uh, this may well have caused a pause, which caused, the old lady to, to, which caused the elderly lady to fall over and uh, fracture a hip, may well be an indication for a pacemaker. Occasionally, we implant these in bifascicular block, but we want to be very, very certain that there are definite symptoms there, so we'll be looking for evidence of pauses on a 24-hour tape. And then again, these uh, specialist indications, so tachybody syndrome, so uh, usually people with conduction problems who can't tolerate uh, beta blockers, because they go too slow, but uh, conversely have atrial fibrillation so they go too fast. So in these scenarios, we implant a pacemaker to prevent the heart rate going too slowly and then give big doses of beta blockers to control the heart rate and the atrial fibrillation. So we make them safe and um, control the atrial fibrillation uh, with a combination of beta blockers and uh, pacing. And then we have specialist indications such as uh, neurogenic, uh, neurocardiogenic syncope, uh, whereby we can pace uh, to prevent vasovagal syncope hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy where we can put a pacing wire in a particular part of the septum to cause the activation sequence of the left ventricle to be slightly different so it improves cardiac ejection. And finally we have uh, heart failure where we implant uh, biventricular pacemakers where there will be a lead of course going to the right atrium, right ventricle and uh, through the coronary sinus to pace the left side of the heart. That concludes the past test uh, cardiology uh, video series. I hope you've enjoyed the videos and I hope you find them useful as part of your revision planning.